Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Coming up, Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka and Minority Leader Tom Bach offer their perspectives on the upcoming legislative session. Plus, the state's economist provides context for the latest budget and economic forecast. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Lawmakers are gearing up for the 2019 legislative session. Joining me in the studio to highlight the Senate Republican priorities for the coming session is Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka. Welcome. It's good to be here again. On Twitter, you identified three issues that you want to work on immediately when session begins. Uh, school safety, preventing elder abuse, and addressing health care costs. All three of these are major, major issues. So what are your expectations for the Senate? So first of all, I'm hoping we can get them done early or at least begin to get them done early. At the end of last session, we had a spending bill that, that got vetoed, but those things were in there and I think we were at a point that we agreed on them. So I've circled back to Representative Hortman, who's gonna be the new speaker, and we had a conversation about taking some of those issues that I, you just mentioned, and if we both agree with the wording that came out of that bill, Let's do those early. And so for sure the first two we'll do early and, and then some of the health care cost issues. But anytime we look at a health care cost issue that comes up, uh, whether it's uh, uh, transparency or opioid issues or whatever the issues are that are driving up costs, if we can try to deal with them one at a time moving through the session, let's do that as well. Well, with health care costs, Senator Benson in a recent committee said, you know, you, you tackle one, one side of it and something else pops up in yeah. another place. So. I mean, it's kind of whack-a-mole a little bit, right, with health care? That's why Senator Benson, Senator Abler, and Senator Housley all have a piece of health care because that's the most complicated part of the overall budget. Uh, so many issues, uh, well, some of you mentioned, uh, then we've got the DWRS issue, we've got the premium ta provider tax going away. I mean, just there are a lot of issues there, but we have good people working on it, and, and overall, I think we'll have a, a good end result in that area, too. And then speaking of the elder abuse and uh, school safety, you want to build on the work that was done last session and try to just get those through the goalposts sooner rather than later. Yeah, so school safety, we had three different bills that had resources for school safety. It, it, part of it came up as a, re a result of some of the gun issues, and we said, we know that we can all agree on making our schools safer. We also wanted to provide more mental health counselors in schools, and so we put it in three bills. One of those bills was signed by the governor, the other two were not, and so we know that there's unfinished business there that we can move forward right away. And then elder abuse, uh, you know, one of the agencies, they did not, they had a backlog of complaints that they weren't addressing. That really started the conversation about what do we do about this. I think we were pretty close, and as I've talked to some of the, the people that are interested in that issue, they've actually moved even farther uh, during the interim. And so we might change that a little bit, but it'll only be if we're in agreement on both sides and can do it right away. But I think we can. Left undone last year was the states conforming to the federal tax law changes. Commissioner of Revenue Bowerly recently said it would be difficult to make any changes on, on their end in terms of software and planning for 2018. But from your point of view, should the Senate's goal be getting that tax conformity piece done for 2018 or planning for 2019? And then within that, how much should it cost? How much, you know, where are you, what's your perspective on that tax conformity issue? Yeah, first of all, that was a bill that we did get to the governor's desk twice. Uh, we added more sa school safety the second time, hoping we'd get it passed, but it was vetoed twice. Very, very frustrating. So we, we knew that it had to be done. Now we're kind of behind. Even if we got it done in January, it's still the impact for this uh, filing season is, is already, it's already there. It's not going to go away. So uh, what do we do about it? Well, we know that we need to do conformity. And we have to make sure that we're, when we conform, that we don't uh, raise taxes on, on Minnesotans. Uh, people should know that most people's federal taxes are going down. But in Minnesota, because we're a high tax state, if we just conform, we actually collect more money in Minnesota. And so, so when we do it, I want to make sure that we put a little extra money into that tax conformity so that the individual doesn't pay more taxes in Minnesota. That'll be 200, 300 million, somewhere in there. I think is what it will take, but, 
but it is a priority of mine and as far as whether it's 18 or 19 that'll be the conversation we'll all work on together um, the Minnesota Revenue tried to make some adjustments in the interim to make sure that you know people that filing it wasn't so difficult uh, but we'll decide whether it should be 18 or 19 probably in May okay so what issues are people maybe failing to talk about right now? You know, as we gear up for session, there's always the big issues like tax conformity and health care that everyone is talking about. What are some issues that maybe aren't at the top of the list, but you think will get done this session? So one of them will be child care, and that, that has a, a bunch of different areas. Uh, in, in outstate, for sure, the regulations that we've imposed on them have caused a lot of people to get out of that. And so we need to get more people engaged and so regulations will be part of it. How do we make it easier for, say, a, a mom or dad that has two kids at home and they want to bring in four more kids you know, to help cover their own expenses? We want more of those people doing that. And then all over, uh, particularly the suburbs, you know, the cost of daycare is just off the charts. It's for most families, it's, it's more than their home mortgage. So, should we be looking at a, a child care tax credit? Uh, I'm something I'm open to. And then the third part of that is, is the abuse. We saw near the end of last session, $100 million a year being funneled out of our daycare system through fraud. We need to correct that. So that's one big one on the horizon. The other one at the end of session was the hands-free or what do we do with distracted, distracted. driving. Mm -hmm. uh, in the bill that got vetoed, we had more penalties, but there were a lot of people that wanted hands-free. and. That one was interesting. When I got back to my district, I was talking to some people and it was like the number one issue they brought up is, hey, hands-free, we're tired of people you know, driving with their phones and not paying attention. So I could see both of those having some sort of solutions this session. As a leader, considering that IHS, the state's, uh, the, the, who the state uses to help with the, the forecast, is predicting an economic slowdown beginning in 2021. We have a tightening labor market, there's a demographic shift as the baby boomers retire. What do policy policymakers need to keep in mind in terms of the budget and the economic growth or potential slowdown in Minnesota? So first of all, I would say we shouldn't spend more than the revenues we have, have coming in. And, and we project revenues to grow about 2.5%. So be careful that we don't overspend. Um, and secondly, people should have some confidence that we filled up the reserve accounts. We have more cash and reserve accounts than we've ever had, which is a really good thing. The main reason we do that is for downturns and then sometimes there's an emergency that needs something, but we put ourselves in a good spot. And so it's been a long economic uh, recovery, or not recovery, but you know, increase year after year. It's been smaller each year than we expected, but, but longer, and so that's been really good. And you know, downturns happen, that's part of the cycle. You just have to prepare for them, and as long as we don't spend too much money, and the fact that we have the reserves tells me we're, we're in good shape. One more thing, you've already had experience working with the House Speaker designate Melissa Hortman. Tell us about your expectations for working with Governor-elect Tim Walz. You said you've had a few conversations. What are your hopes? So first of all, I'm hoping that we can have a relationship where we, we communicate very well, that we understand each other, that we're working towards the same goal of, of making Minnesota the best place it can be. If, if we can do that, we're going to get a lot done. We're not going to get everything, hardly anything, if anything, way on the left or way on the right. As much as we both may want that, we're not going to get that. And then secondly, if we can communicate, we can try to get to a place where we agree on three-way targets, which means we all agree on what the budget should be, like early May, some, somewhere early, not in the last week or two. And if we can do that, then the whole process will be much more transparent and we'll actually get to the finish line on a timely basis where people have really been able to weigh in and we'll get better policy for Minnesota. So, but I am optimistic, I've, I've met him once, we've had about four phone calls. Uh, I, if he does what he says he wants to do, we're gonna be in a good spot. Senate Majority Leader Gazelka, it's always a pleasure, thank you. You bet. Now joining me in the studio to offer the Senate DFL caucus perspective is Senate Minority Leader Tom Bach. Thanks for being here. No, happy to be with you. What are the top three priorities for your caucus this session? Well, we haven't uh, taken the time yet to sit down as a group and, and talk about that. We're gonna do that 
uh, right after session starts and the first Saturday after session starts. I'm anxious to see kind of what priorities come out of the new administration uh, and because he will submit his budget to the legislature uh, before the legislature really gets rolling. The legislature doesn't really get started until after we get the February forecast, which is about 1st of March. Uh, the administration will have to submit a budget to the legislature on the 19th of February, I believe. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'm looking forward to seeing what the new House majority in the House is thinking about. So uh, kind of common for the Senate to take a little more time, a little longer view in developing that. Uh, I certainly want to be able to the extent I can be on the same page as the House Democrats and, and, and the governor so that we get a productive session. Uh, last year was incredibly unproductive, probably the most unproductive I've ever seen in, in all my years here. Well, and speaking of the unpro unproductivity, many measures were left undone due to the Governor Dayton's veto of that omnibus spending bill. Uh, Senator Gazelka has said that some measures like school safety and curbing opioid abuse may be able to get done early in session. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we probably share that view that uh, it was interesting in that there were, I think, three significant policy issues that kind of rose to the top last session that I think there was strong bipartisan agreement we we're going to try to do something about. One was the opioid crisis the state has. Uh, the other was try to make our schools safer uh, for our kids. And then the third one was the issue of uh, long-term care and vulnerable people and some it got characterized as elder abuse, but it's more than that. It's about vulnerable people and not and getting not getting the in, right yes. kind of care. Uh, and I think there was strong agreement that we we're going to get those things done, and none of them happened. So I, I think from the Senate's perspective, uh, you know, 67, 66 of the 67 senators are returning. We were all part of that conversation uh, last session. We heard the bills, uh, met with all the affected parties. Uh, so I think it's relatively easy for the Senate to say, well, let's move forward to something we didn't finish. Uh, so I think Senator Gazelka and I kind of share that. The challenge is over on the other side of the street in the State House, uh, they just went through an election. And there's, I don't know the number, 45, maybe 50 new members between uh, Democrats and Republicans over there. Those new people haven't been part of the conversation. They know nothing about... Uh, uh, the the kind of the intended consequences sometimes you it's I, I always urge new members to you know be careful you come here with certain perceptions about things and then pretty soon all the different advocacy groups and interests come to talk to you about maybe what you didn't even contemplate might be uh, an issue around a vote you're going to take and you're going to own not only the consequences but the unintended ones when you cast the vote so I think it's a little more difficult for the House to move too fast because they got so many people who weren't part of the conversation last so year. So some of the momentum may be limited by the new House members. I, in fairness to them, yeah, they haven't been part of the process. And, and I, I think, you know, before they're asked to take votes on it that, you know, ultimately come back in the next campaign, potentially, uh, I, I think they need a vetting of the issues. Well, another area of bipartisan agreement, I believe, is, is the rising cost of health care. It's possible that the public option for Minnesota Care that Governor-elect Walls campaigned on and some of the House DFL are in favor of, though won't make it through the Senate due to the, 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 the logistics in the Senate. Where might there be common ground if it's not a public option for Minnesota Care? Well, I wouldn't rule that out. Uh, you know, my experience is governors get most of what they want. And, you know, I don't know what uh, Governor-elect Walls' priorities are going to be, but my experience here is, you know, when we start bumping up, the end of, bumping up against the end of the session and governors have strong feelings about something, they tend to be to prevail more than not. And so I don't know to the extent this is really a strong priority for the incoming governor or not, but if it is, uh, I think it will be part of the conversation right up to the end of session. The interesting thing about the public option in Minnesota Care is it actually is something that came out of the state Senate. The state Senate passed that back in 2015 when I was the majority leader. It really, Senator Lorry kind of drove the train at HHS and we put it into our omnibus uh, health and human service bill and we weren't able to get the House Republicans to take it. But the larger discussion around uh, Minnesota Care though is about the fact that the 
the tax that pays for Minnesota Care, the provider the tax, provider tax which has a sunset on it. So it's mm -hmm. expiring in the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. So some, if, if you're going to talk about having Minnesota Care, I mean, put the public option on the side. If you're going, if Minnesota Care is going to survive as a program for those 130,000 Minnesotans or whatever it is, and I think what 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 viewers need to remind themselves of is these are people that get up, pack a lunch bucket, and go to work every day. And they just happened, it's low income insurance for low income Minnesotans who have a job whose employer doesn't provide them health insurance and they're paying a premium for it. So uh, I think the legislature is going to have to make, a, make some consideration is do we want to continue that for low income people who are working who employers don't provide health insurance or do we just want to kick them to the curb? And I would argue uh, we need to find a way to continue that which is going to uh, mean we're going to have to have a conversation about if not the provider tax that's sunsetting, what do we put in place of it? What does it look like uh, so that we can continue the existing program uh, even with the, the day of a, of a buy-in kind of off on the side? Let's turn to the state budget. Um, the state is projected to have a $1.5 billion surplus. We have $2 billion in the reserves. But following the forecast, DFL lawmakers urged caution do you agree that lawmakers should limit new spending, in particular because of the projected economic slowdown that was forecast in, in a few out years? Well, I'm one of the people that's urging caution on the spending side. And I, I know the, you know, the headline that says $1.5 billion is going to excite a lot of people that uh, want to come to the Capitol and are doing important work and back in our communities and they see some opportunity to get some money to improve the way they deliver some programming in, in back in our communities, but almost half of that money is what we call one time, in that it's, it, it's, it's not going to reoccur. Some of it is just some money we appropriated back in uh, the last budget cycle that didn't get spent, where spending came in under what we expected. Small amount of it, about half of it, is, is new revenue growth. So, uh, and I actually have suggested to Senator Gazelka that he should give his committees two budget targets, one for spending one-time money, because you can only spend it once. And then one for to do things that are going to be ongoing that carry into the next biennium. I haven't talked to the incoming uh, Speaker of the House about that yet, but we need to be very, very careful because the $850 million or so that is available uh, to be spent in, in the biennium, upcoming biennium, it doesn't all reoccur in the next biennium. And we always look at not only the current biennium we're appropriating money for, but if we, once we appropriate money, what's it going to be in the next biennium for the next legislature? Uh, and uh, the, so there's about 850 that uh, are available for the committee chairs to spend all across the state uh, budget, but only about 450 of that in the biennium beyond. So if you spend the entire 850 million that's available, uh, you're going to be over 400 mil billion in the red, uh, or 400 million in the red in the in the next biennium. So. Uh, so it, the it's a real challenge. Isn't it's, really the surplus that it looks like. It doesn't mean the coffers are over full and, and we, there can be new spending. It, it really should be considered carefully. Well, and, and yeah, absolutely. And, and the, uh, you know, watch the, uh, the incoming monthly receipts. I noticed just this week we got the numbers for November collect, state collections, and they're down $6 million from November. So over a week, we've already lost $6 million on what they were forecasting we were, we were going to have. So uh, small little uh, ticks in the economy have big, big revenue swings in, in, in the state budget. So, uh, you know, have, have coming off of more than a decade of managing deficits, I really don't want to hand off to the next legislature a deficit. So I'm going to urge some caution on things that are ongoing. The one-time money provides tremendous opportunities for us to invest some money in, like, over at the Public Facilities Authority like, to help cities with water time. infrastructure mm -hmm. for broadband around the state. There's some great investments where, uh, where we could spend some one-time money and be a little cautious on the, the ongoing stuff in the budget. Senator Bach, it's always a pleasure. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you.
first of the two budget and economic forecasts that provide crucial information to lawmakers as they structure the state's next two-year budget is out. Joining me to talk more about it is Minnesota's state economist, Dr. Laura Kalimbakidis. Welcome. Thank you. Let's begin with a snapshot. As of now, Minnesota's economy is doing well, right? Yeah, that's right. So we have been adding jobs at a steady pace throughout this long U.S. economic expansion, and we're still adding jobs. We have some wage growth. We have a number of industries that are doing well. This year, exports have done quite well, although there's some challenges come going forward with that. Uh, we have a very large share of Minnesotans who are of working age are working, and we have the largest or the highest labor force participation rate among states, and so uh, we are doing quite well now. So a lot of good news, and then in terms of the projected budget balance, it's $1.5 billion for lawmakers. Right above you know the normal for the next two-year budget we also have two billion dollars in our reserve account but at the following the announcements the many leaders spoke of a cautious, cautious approach so from your perspective as an economist mm -hmm. why does a cautious approach make sense right now yeah so minnesota's economy is doing quite well but Minnesota's economy is closely tied to the U.S. and global economies. And so we have a distribution of employment across industries that's very similar to the U.S. That means that we don't have a lot of state-specific economic risk, but we do have risks regarding what happens in the U.S. economy. And the forecast is for the U.S. economy to slow down and continue growing, but to slow down. Um, and at the same time, Minnesota, uh, while we have growing tax revenues, our tax revenue, revenues are expected to grow from biennium to biennium throughout our forecast period, our revenue growth is slowing down as well. And so uh, we need to set ourselves up budget-wise to uh, be able to adapt to that slowdown, to be able to continue providing services throughout that slowdown. And that's what the budget reserve is for. And with that projected slowdown, we're currently experiencing the second longest economic expansion if we make it to the middle of next year, it will be the longest economic expansion yeah. in U.S. history. So there's now talk of a potential downturn. Mm -hmm. Is it pessimistic? Is it just like, well, things have got to change, the shoe has got to drop, or is it sure. pragmatic? Or what are the signs that are maybe showing that the economy may slow down across the U.S.? Yeah, so there is slow growth in our um, outlook in the the U.S. outlook, but even that slow growth has some risks associated with it. So there are risks with regard to um, global growth. So global growth is slowing. So Germany has, has contracted, China has slowed down, Japan has slowed down. Those are some, those are some signs that are important for the U.S. Um, so what are some other risks? There are risks to uh, the monetary policy. So the Fed is tightening monetary policy. Uh, how long, how long, how fast and how long is that going to go on and what's the impact of that going to be? Then there are demographic changes. So there's the aging of the population and that's expected to, uh, to slow the U.S. economy, but we don't know exactly how that's going to play out. So economies are very intricate, both at state, national, global. Mm -hmm. The state uses IHS yeah. uh, to consult with, to kind of come up with the forecast. And so we're talking about lowered forecast growth. Are there any other drivers of this slower growth? For example, there have been tariffs on mm -hmm. China, and that's affecting the soybean farmers in the state. There's also been um, production on the iron range is yeah. on the upkeep due to the, those same tariffs. So how does that factor in to our state? Yeah, so the slower growth that's projected is further out. And so that's not so much the reason for the slower growth in the, in the out years. The okay. slower growth in the out years is due to demographic change. It's due to slower global growth. It's due to some federal, federal monetary policy, federal fiscal policy, those kinds of things. Um, but in the nearer term, there are impacts on Minnesota sectors that are affected by tariffs. And so uh, indeed for soybean farmers, this has been a challenge to have retaliatory tariffs from China on U.S. Um, commodities. And so we saw we saw a big swing in soybean exports this year, where exports were really high at the beginning of the year in advance of the tariffs, trying to beat that deadline. And then they, they went down later this year. And so soybean farmers, corn farmers, um, you know, commodity farmers in general, dairy has, uh, has real challenges right now with low global prices. All of those uh, farmers are trying to figure out, well, what exactly is going to happen? Are these tariffs going to persist? 
Um, what's this going to mean for me next year? So planning is, uh, is difficult for industries that are affected by tariffs. And that includes manufacturers who are importing intermediate goods, so things that they use to, uh, to produce goods and then for export. Uh, that policy uncertainty is difficult for them. But um, for Minnesota, there are differential effects across the state because the U.S. has these protectionist tariffs on, um, on imported steel. And most of the iron ore that comes out of the iron range is used in domestic steel production. So if those protectionist tariffs actually work and protect U.S. steel manufacturing, that could help on the iron range. So some good news for some sectors, bad news for other sectors, mm -hmm. just but also a level of uncertainty going forward, which is probably normal. Well, this seems this seems more uncertain than normal. Having um, you know, U.S. trade policy is not normally in this level of flux, and policy uncertainty like that is uh, is a cost imposes costs on businesses. So businesses that import intermediate goods that are subject to uh, tariffs on the way in, they're trying to figure out well, what, I, how does this disrupt my supply chain, and should I be looking for domestic producers of those goods, and could the domestic producers possibly ramp up in time? And so that policy uncertainty means that firms are having to pay extra to insure against that uncertainty, and it could mean that firms hold uh, hold back on their investment. Um, plans, and that can slow the economy on its own. One final point. Um, unemployment, you referenced this a little bit earlier. There are now more jobs than job seekers in Minnesota. We have a tight labor market expected to continue to tighten because of the demographic change of yep. the baby boomers aging out of the workforce. How do you expect this to affect our economy over the next few years? Yeah, so especially firm or industries that are very labor intensive and actually need those hands-on workers like healthcare. Um, they are they are struggling to find those workers, and so they're looking for creative solutions. So what I th how I think this is going to affect our economy is that employment growth is increasingly constrained by slow labor force growth, and that means that going forward, if we're going to continue to generate the tax revenues and the, the income that supports those tax revenues, then we're going to need wages per worker or income per worker to go up even as our employment growth slows. So that is going to affect lots of industries who are going to have to offer higher wages. But it means that employers are getting creative on how to make the matches, how to find those workers that are still out there looking for work. They may be investing in productivity enhancing technologies so that they can produce the same amount of stuff with fewer people. They may be looking at more flexible workplaces. They may be looking at populations of workers that they've overlooked before um, and create some, some paths to employment for folks that have had a harder time getting into the workforce. And that's something that can be very encouraging for Minnesota if we do forge those pathways and if we maintain them so that we get everybody in the game in the state of Minnesota. Dr. Kalamakitis, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.